Susanna Grant is the creator and showrunner of the Netflix limited series Unbelievable, for which she was nominated for two Emmys, Best Limited Series and Best Writing for a Limited Series or Movie. Uh, now, it's based on a true story into uh, a, 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 an investigation into a sexual predator, which is some really disturbing subject matter at times. Uh, so at what point did you first come across the story and know that you wanted to tell it on the screen? You know, it was, uh, it was written up uh, as a ProPublica and Marshall Project article, and I read it shortly after it came out. Um, it was by Ken Armstrong and T. Christian Miller, two fantastic journalists. And I knew immediately when I read it that I wanted to do it as a, I thought, I thought for a moment about doing it as a feature, but there was so much there that uh, we decided it was better to, it would just be better if we had a lot of time to really explore all the nuances of it. Um, so we brought it to CBS with whom uh, my partner Sarah Timberman had a deal and they jumped at it and we gave it to Netflix and they committed immediately. So there was a lot of enthusiasm for really tackling the subject in a, in a challenging and honest way. And, uh, you know, the way the story unfolds in the miniseries is uh, the investigation sort of that we follow with Tony Collette and Merritt Weaver's characters, that starts in episode two. The first episode is entirely focused around uh, the victim of, of one of the assaults, Marie Adler, who is not believed by the police when she reports her crime because there are inconsistencies in her story and the police don't know what to expect from an assault victim. And so they make these incredibly traumatic mistakes. Uh, what, what was the thought process behind wanting to really give Marie's story and Marie's experience that, that focal point attention for that entire first episode? You know, it, the thinking was that she deserved it, that the story deserved it. It, it seems, you know, that the, the title is unbelievable and that maybe gives the impression that the experience is uncommon, but actually this experience is far more common for sexual assault survivors than the case in Colorado where everything was done just right. One of the um, remarkable things about this story was that it's it was two parallel stories, one in which the investigation goes wrong in ways that are far too common and ordinary and disastrous, and the other in which the investigation goes remarkably well because people are willing to put in the effort, the dedication, and they're properly trained about how to investigate sexual assault. Uh, what was that collaboration with uh, Michael Chabon and Alec Waldman like, you know, crafting that first episode in particular? Well, they, we all found the story um, coincidentally at the same time, and they had brought it to Sarah Timberman, and I had as well, and so we all said, well, we're all, you know, why not, why not all join the same party? So we all dove in together, and um, there was a lot of, you know, we did a bit of back and forth about how exactly to tell the story, um, so a little bit of a collaboration on, on how to find it, and, which always happens. Um, and then, you know, finally settled in on devoting that first episode completely to Marie. But Michael and Ayala are great, both so smart and have, you know, tremendous novel, you know, uh, fiction writing careers and nonfiction writing careers. They're, they're remarkable, remarkable writers. Uh, I imagine one of the challenges, uh, not only in that first episode, but throughout the series, that you do see some of the, you know, glimpses of that assault from, from Marie's point of view, and you see yeah. some of her traumatizing experiences after that, you know, reporting it and, and having to be uh, checked out at the hospital and all of these really uh, uh, difficult things to watch um, and, and certainly must have been excruciating for her to experience. Uh, you know, what was, what was it like trying to find that balance of, of, of really presenting her experiences without kind of, you know, exploiting them, as we often see in other kind of media about these kinds of Yeah, books. that was really, really important to me. You know, this is based on a real story, and I was in communication with um, the real Marie, and not being uh, sensational about it was incredibly important. That's how I ended up um, writing, and then Lisa Cholodenko shot the assault scenes and and there are very few moments of it but i think they're very powerful but shooting them all from her point of view so that you're never watching it you're never a voyeur of sexual assault which um you know i think all of us are inadvertently in our culture just because there's such a proliferation of you know rape porn out there um either overt uh, or just sort of alluded to in our in our 
advertising and other media. So we really, really, really wanted to avoid that. That was really important. Um, and then, you know, the other thing is that I had heard, I had sort of internalized this phrase, the investigation is often a second, feels like a second assault to a survivor. And I wanted to unpack that. I wanted to, I wanted to understand that for myself, and I wanted our audience to understand that, to walk through it with someone and, and really internalize what that means. And I, going through it in sort of meticulous detail, I think had that effect. Uh, and, you know, unusual to a lot of uh, kind of true stories, uh, Marie Adler is actually an executive producer uh, on the series as well. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, what was it like working with her on telling her own story and, and how closely did you work with her to, to, to really present this in a, in a faithful and, and truthful way? You know, Marie's a, a remarkable young woman, and um, she had already, obviously, if you watch the show, you know that she had to tell her story way too many times when it happened. And then when uh, Ken Armstrong, the reporter, found her, she she generously told it again because she thought, well, if I do that and this gets out, maybe it will prevent another young woman or any age woman going th from, you know, having to go through it. Um, so I didn't actually ask her that much about what had happened. Ken and T had done such meticulous reporting. We had so much information. They gave us all their police files. We had the entire case file. You know, we had, we had the photographs of the lacerations on her wrists. We had a lot of information. So the only time we reached out to her and told her our intentions and said, feel free to tell us what what would be, you know, horrible if we missed or horrible if we got wrong or what's really important that we not miss. And um, we talked to her a bit about that. And then when something would come up that wasn't in the other material, we would reach out and, and ask her, you know, mundane things like what kind of cell phone did you have? And, you know, we wanted to be as truthful and faithful um, to the story as possible. Um, but it was also really important to us that she have ownership of the telling of, co-ownership of the telling of her story. It had been so stolen from her in the moment and so abused and twisted and used against her. Uh, so having her be a part of our team was really important on just sort of an ethical level for all of us. Uh, and, uh, you know, for all, for everything that Marie goes through uh, throughout the series, uh, you know, it, it, it is a little comforting to know that by the end of it, she did get justice and she was vindicated, even though, of course, it couldn't take away what she had gone through throughout the experience, both the assault and the aftermath. Um, you know, you also wrote and direct those last couple of episodes. What was the feeling like of sort of bringing Marie Justice in those last two episodes after ha after having presented everything that had that she had struggled with for all that time. It, it, you know, I had this sense as I was, as we were building the show, to me, I had this vision of these two remarkable detectives in Colorado putting together um, this case. And as they were doing it, they were unknowingly building a lifeboat for someone who was drowning hundreds of miles away. And, and just as she's about to get pulled under, they finished their boat. And that was a sort of creative vision I had in mind. Um, and to finally um, marry them and have them meet and have not only give Marie the, the satisfaction of understanding that her her truth has been seen, but also um, giving those two detectives the satisfaction of knowing that all that hard work uh, was worth something. And, and, and it's sort of this larger issue that when you do something good in the world, you have no idea how far the positive effects of that will go, sometimes well beyond your intentions or well beyond your knowledge. They happen to find it out this time, but um, that, that was important to me. I felt that very strongly from the story, so communicating that 
was really important and satisfying. And uh, yeah, the, the the series premiered last fall, um, mm -hmm. and so you know what's interesting now since you know of what's happened in 2020 and the ideas around policing is that it almost it, it almost sort of feels like it it belongs as part of that conversation because I know a lot of people who talk about defunding the police now are saying as part of the argument, well, police are charged with doing too many things that they're not equipped to deal with, and this is about a case where you have two different sets of cops and yeah. one. One one uh, pair of detectives make things much worse, and the other pair actually helps and make it better. Uh, you know, do you feel like it's a, it fits into that conversation of what we ask police to do and how we ask them to do it, uh, or, or does it feel like kind of a completely different kind of scenario? Well, I think it it really speaks to the larger issue of police training. That was that was the key difference in these two cases. I mean that. The gender is notable. It was two male cops in Washington and two female cops in Colorado. But the difference in their training was remarkable. And and I think what we see culturally is a uh, you know in in the world now in 2020. I'm not going to weigh in on the issue of policing. There are very smart people who've studied it far longer and deeper than I have. But but I do feel that training is a component of it. Um, in terms of what we ask them to do, you know, this is a this is a violent crime that they were investigating um, and they brought compassion to the investigation of a violent crime. Whether that should always be a police detective with a gun and a badge who shows up in the wake of that, I don't know. That's for, that's for somebody else to say. But I do think looking hard at how we train and um, utilize our officers is, is really important, you know, that the thing I so admired about those Colorado detectives is that they really take, not admired, admire now, uh, really take that phrase to protect and serve, that motto to heart. And that is how they do their job every single day. And, uh, you know, you, you've uh, worked on uh, fact-based stories uh, mm -hmm. a number of times before, Aaron Brockovich, Confirmation. Um, is that something you're particularly drawn to, is, is sort of bringing true stories to light, or, or has it just kind of shaped up that way, that these sort of the projects that, uh, that have, have come across your, your path? I tell you what I'm interested in is um, the abuse of power, the imbalance of power, how power gets wielded in our society and and stories, you know, people who who risk a lot in their lives to reset the balance of power and culture. And um, and there are some really remarkable true stories of that. And um, I don't know if they find me or I find them, but I am drawn to them. Um, but you know, I, I, I've done a lot of originals as well, so I, I wouldn't say it's not a design. Um, to, to only do fact-based stories, but but there are some, I mean, you have the opportunity to tell a story about Anita Hill, that's hard to pass up. And, uh, you know, the way you depict the police officers, the ones who, who make those terrible mistakes uh, at the beginning, uh, is, is, is very human in the sense that we don't, we don't look at them as like horrible villains or as, uh, as, as kind of monsters. You know, this is something that monsters do to people. No, it's something that well-meaning people can do to other human beings. So what do you hope people who may be looking at this from a, a perspective where they may not have the experience either and they may doubt and they may uh, be unsure about a story or something like, like what, what do you hope they would get out of uh, watching it, uh, this series? Well, you know, I looked at the numbers and the statistics in sexual assault are so staggering. The small percentage that are reported and of those that are reported the small percentage that are investigated and of those the tiny percentage that are actually prosecuted and i thought you don't get numbers like that because of some bad apples this is a st systemic issue this is a cultural issue and and i immediately become you know ask myself in what ways am i contributing to that what misperceptions might i have and so it was important for me to show that um this is not a story of a couple of mustache twirling villains in in you know washington state this is this is something we've all it's, it's been in the groundwater we've all 
absorbed that women's bodies are not their own, that an assault on a woman's body is n not maybe worth our full attention. I mean, these are fallacies that, that are, it, these, these are like toxic messages that come at us from all directions. So I was hoping by humanizing those cops, I mean, aside from the fact that I think all human beings should be humanized, um, I was hoping that we could all pause and ask ourselves, to what degree am I contributing to this culture? Well, uh, I want to congratulate you on your Emmy nominations for the series, uh, and thank you for the series as well as for uh, joining me today to talk about it. Um, uh, it's, thank it's you. I just I, I want to say a quick congratulations to Tony Collette too, who's also nominated, and also to our absolutely fantastic casting department, who also was nominated by the uh, Academy. So, props uh, well, to best of luck uh, in in September, and uh, thank you again for joining me. Thank you very much. Nice to talk to you. Great to talk to you too.